Oh, I see that it's live now, actually. I see a live. Oh, okay. Maybe it is in the recording. So we'll just go for it and hope that we are live. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, maybe. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for this session. My name is Sarah Carlson. Um, from USAID Washington in the Biodiversity Division. And I'm joined by my colleague, Kirsten Johnson from USAID Washington as well in the Bureau, from, in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And today we're gonna to be talking about some of our recent adventures in cross-sectoral collaboration. And the title of our talk is Strategic Cross-Sectoral Development, Early Lessons from USAID's HEARTH Program. So Kirsten and I are going to talk for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have some time for question and answer at the end. So feel free to type your question into the chat, and then we'll have a short discussion at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and um, go off vid video for the presentation part, and then I'll come, come back on. One second here. Whoops. Sorry, just bear with me. Okay. So we'll just jump right in then. Um, so while the world has seen tremendous gains in development over the last several decades, including in child mortality, education, and people living in extreme poverty as shown in this graph, uh, this has often come at a cost to the natural resources upon which development depends. And so this slide shows extinction risks for many different species increasing in the graph on the left. Um, and then on the right, in a graph from NOAA, you can see carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and emissions both increasing dramatically since the 1960s. And this has led to a situation where the planet has been deeply reconfigured by humans. So three quarters of the Earth's land and two thirds of the ocean have been significantly altered by people and more than 85% of wetlands, critical ecosystems that store floodwaters, purify water, and provide fish habitat have been lost. And this should be very troubling for all of us, not just those of us in the environment sector, because the evidence is growing that the health of the environment and the health of the planet are linked. So Kirsten and I, along with several of our colleagues at USAID and our frequent collaborator, Dr. Anila Jacob, have been interested in this relationship for more than a decade. And so this slide just shows a series of, of studies that we've supported over the years that use geospatial data on tree cover and health data from the Demographic and Health Survey that found positive associations between a healthy environment and better health outcomes. So the first paper published in this series back in 2013 was actually published in the very first volume of Global Health Science and Practice, one of the sponsors of this conference. And so it's really wonderful for us to be speaking on this topic at this particular forum. Um, so since this earlier work, there's been a proliferation of studies on the various ways that a healthy environment contributes to human health and well-being. For example, there's growing evidence that well-functioning ecosystems contribute to combating some of the top killers of children around the world, including pneumonia from polluted air, diarrhea from poor water quality, and malnutrition. Focusing in on food security and nutrition, ecosystem services are critical for supporting crop agriculture through pollination services and building healthy soils, for example. And biodiversity, sustainably harvested, is often a direct source of food and nutrition for many people. For example, over 3 billion people around the world depend on wild fish for food, a major source of protein and micronutrients. And then perhaps the most dramatic and timely example of the importance of a healthy environment to public health is zoonotic disease emergence with more than 70% of emerging infectious diseases originating from wildlife that's come into contact with people either through markets or encroachment into previously isolated habitats. And then finally, we wanted to note here that efforts to conserve nature are also essential to mitigate and adapt to climate change, a major priority of the current Biden administration. One quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions come from deforestation and forest degradation and conserving habitats like the mangrove shown in this picture here can reduce the impacts of intense and more frequent storms that we're seeing under increased climate change. 
And so the weight of the evidence makes clear that to safeguard human health, we need to maintain the health of the planet. And so where does USAID as a major development donor fit into this? How can we take a holistic approach to development that works across sectors to help people and the planet? One of our responses is a new initiative called HEARTH, which stands for Health, Ecosystems, and Agriculture for Resilient, Thriving Societies. And this is a, a funding call for partnerships with the private sector to advance cross-sectoral solutions that conserve threatened landscapes and seascapes and the well-being of people who depend on them. So HEARTH kind of has three big ideas. First, cross-sectoral development problems demand cross-sectoral development solutions. Second, private sector partners are valuable because they understand that first idea and responsible market forces can make our investments go further and be more sustainable. And finally, we need an explicit focus on good monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning so we can build the evidence base for this approach, which is currently lacking. So this slide just shows the process to develop HEARTH and a timeline. In the end, it will end up being almost a 10 year effort with three stages, co-creation of the projects with partners, implementation of the projects, which are for five years, and then monitoring and evaluation and learning, which spans the other two stages. So we're towards the end of the co-creation stage, and this is what we'll talk about today. So designing and getting support for HEARTH at USAID was no small feat, as we'll hear about from Kirsten in a minute, but we managed to get it up and off the ground and received 85 concept notes, of which 15 were selected to move forward into a formal co-design process with USAID the private sector partner and the organizations on the ground who will implement the projects. And so this slide shows the current HEARTH portfolio of 15 projects across 10 countries and representing about $140 million in public and private investment. Each of the multi-sectoral HEARTH projects includes various combinations of the focal areas shown on the right with agriculture, health, climate change, and biodiversity conservation being common features. So as we get ready to wrap up this first co-creation stage of HEARTH, we wanted to share three early lessons from this work and I'll turn it over to Kirsten to get us started. Super, um, thanks very much. <clears throat> Excuse me, thanks Sarah. Um, all right, so our first lesson is for all of you social scientists out there. And that is that if we wanna have successful cross-sectoral work, we need to treat it not only as a technical undertaking, but as a complex social organizational phenomenon. So just like the marketplace that we see in this picture here, we are bringing humans as individuals, as organizations together around a purpose. Um, this is a complex undertaking. And so the question is, with each of our respective responsibilities, priorities, capabilities, and personalities, how do we really draw everyone together and start us moving towards our common goals? Um, so that first thing that we need to bring people together is the compelling reason why. And here's Hearth's why. Um, Humanity is at a tipping point. Um, we observe that pandemic threats are emerging at an increasing rate. We know that the climate is also warming at a rate that is unsustainable for human life as we know it. We also can observe that we are in the midst of the Earth's sixth mass extinction of biodiversity. Now, all of these things are related and they threaten human well being around the world. Um, so, this is a pretty powerful argument for us to come together and take action. And this powerful idea is the reason why we are able to overcome the earliest challenges in getting HEARTH off the ground. Um, people across USAID and our implementing partners 
understand the importance of this challenge. The private, se private sector, the communities and the places where we work, um, our implementing partners all understand this challenge and live with it every day. Um, so people were really willing to go the extra mile to coordinate well and to communicate well um, because we all recognize and understand what's at stake. Um, so starting with this compelling idea is really um, the engine that gets everybody around the table. Um, but once we get them around the table, once they're there, they want to see your plan, um, the hows and the whats, what's going to make this really work? Um, how are we going to work together in a practical way from a process perspective? Um, people want to know what we're going to do to deliver on those results that underpin um, that big idea. Um, they want to know how we're going to pay for this. All, you know, excellent questions. Um, and so, so we need to have a plan for articulating those hows and those whats. Um, and then a third element of this lesson is the need to really do everything by co-design. And I'm not just talking about a, a de designing an activity with our private sector and implementing partners, the co-design in a formal sense. I mean, we all need to collaborate with one another with real intentionality, welcome each other into this work. There is a lot to do in a cross-sectoral activity, and we need everybody working together to make it happen. Uh, we can only, again, as Sarah mentioned earlier, um, develop cross-sectoral solutions um, to cross-sectoral problems. And um, to do that, we need to collaborate, we need the collaboration, and we need the trust that emerges uh, from that collaborative uh, work. Next slide. Um, so to give you a sense of the kind of complexity that we can uh, encounter when we're working on, on this type of cross-sectoral activity, I'd like to share an illustrative example of, of a hearth activity, and we'll call it um, mangoes for mamas. Um, so here, in this example, the idea is to improve the quantity and quality of a nutrient of nutrient-rich mangoes through regenerative agroforestry and also partnering that intervention with improved access to healthcare. Um, we anticipate results to include uh, improved economic well-being, health and nutrition, improved ability to mitigate and adapt to climate change, um, conservation of, of forests and the species that live in them, uh, as well as eventually ecotourism of the ne nearby conservancy, which will in turn um, both support biodiversity conservation and improve economic well-being of the nearby community. So to accomplish this, there's a range of stakeholders that we need to engage. We have a private sector mango company, a maternal health social enterprise, a biodiversity conservation NGO, a development NGO, and USAID, both in the missions and in Washington. Um, and so, um, the question is, how do you organize across all of these stakeholders? And this, this slide is just another illustration, a visual representation of the complex, uh, complexity that we're talking about. So we've got a single hearth, or a single mangoes for mamas on the left-hand side of the slide. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see that complexity multiplied by 15, which is kind of what hearth looks like, right? And so with all of these complexities multiplied, we really have to be cognizant of working well together toward our common goals. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, so first and foremost, we have to build in the time that's required to work across sectors. We don't all speak the same technical language and it really does take time to understand each other. Um, we also need to recognize the importance of developing ways to communicate about our project, um, like PowerPoint presentations and fact sheets. Um, we need to anticipate the need to repeatedly advocate for and communicate about the activity. And what makes this tricky is that we're not just communicating to one bureau or one sector, but to multiple audiences in a way that needs to be tailored to each audience's needs and priorities. And so this also takes time and careful crafting and um, you know, more than you would think. So building that in up front is really important. Um, secondly, Cross-sectoral activities can be challenging in a bureaucracy. So finding ways to minimize paperwork and make it easier for people to collaborate was a, it sounds like a pedestrian thing, but it's, it was a critical tactic in actually getting hard up and running successfully. 
Um, and then finally, we found that engaging with private sector partners, um, those that have long-term commitments to the places where we work also, and you know, that have potential to beneficially shift markets and practices at scale has really been essential to holding this, this whole um, endeavor together. Um, Thanks, Kirsten. So I'm gonna talk about our second lesson, which was, um, you know, with such a large and complicated program in a difficult social organizational context, it really helped us to use a common methodology to design these projects. So to design the 15 hearths, we used a commonly used incredible method in the conservation sector, which is called the conservation standards. And this is a fairly straightforward project design process that walked our design teams through developing the context or problem analysis for each site, selecting interventions to address the problem, and developing theories of change that laid out the logic for how the intervention should work. So using this common design process allowed us to use the same taxonomy to talk about the different components of the designs which in turn allowed us to identify similarities and differences across the sites. Um, so while we're not at a point where we can talk about specific hearth projects because of procurement sensitivity issues, this slide describes in a general way the different human development outcomes that the hearth, por hearth portfolio seeks to influence. So you can see that most of the hearth projects hope to positively influence livelihoods, resilience, governance, food security, climate change, and health. So knowing this allows us to compare the various pathways through which each hearth hopes to achieve these outcomes and design common indicators to measure them. Similarly, it turned out that many of the hearths are targeting similar aspects of biodiversity to conserve such as forests, mangroves, and wildlife species that are overhunted or illegally poached. And again, this comparison across sites allowed us to develop, will allow us to develop similar methods to measure change in these conservation targets. All hearth sites reflect global threats to the environment, including the largest, which is habitat loss due to agricultural expansion, but also poaching, illegal mining and logging, fires, and climate change. And when we tallied these up across the hearth sites, it turned out that some of these threats are more prevalent than others as shown here on this graph. So for example, land clearing for agriculture, overhunting of bushmeat species, unsustainable charcoal production, and poaching of high value species like elephants are the most common threat, environmental threats across hearth. So knowing this allows us to set up an analytical framework to explore the best ways to mitigate these threats. And then finally, when we look at the most common interventions across HEART, we again saw a lot of similarities. So there were six interventions that were the most common, and those are listed here. All hearths are taking a conservation enterprise approach, which are environmentally friendly businesses that link income to maintaining a healthy environment. So ecotourism would be an example of this. Many hearths are using regenerative agriculture to improve on-farm productivity, to reduce the need to encroach into forests. And many are improving access to health services, including maternal and child health, with the idea that providing a health service as part of a conservation effort will build support in the local communities. So behind each of these interventions, whoops, um, sorry about that, is a pretty big hypothesis that gets to the heart uh, of an approach like hearth. So these are some of the big questions that we hope to address. And then along with these interventions, we also saw kind of like the bread and butter of what USA does. So governance and institutional strengthening, capacity building, and good land use planning. So with all of these interventions being implemented across multiple sites, this allows us to set up you know, our M&E to understand how effective these approaches actually are or under which conditions they are most effective. And so that takes us up to our final lesson, lesson three. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so as Sarah described, um, projects like Hearth really provide a rare opportunity to fill knowledge gaps in cross-sectoral 
market-based development? Under what condition do these types of activities actually produce the results that we're looking for? Um, but in order to fill those knowledge gaps, you have to make sure that you integrate your mural planning into your activity design right from the start. Um, so mural thinking contributes to project design by helping to identify any logical gaps in an activity's theory of change, and also by informing discussions with most recent findings from the literature. Um, mural colleagues also help the design team to identify those critical key results and how they should be measured, um, either through developing custom indicators that are really tightly linked to the results that the design team is aiming for, or through identifying which standard indicators are most appropriate for the project. <clears throat> to generate the data that we need in order to be accountable to communities and to taxpayers, and to provide evidence on what works, um, we also need to make sure that we establish our metrics at baseline and we measure them really well. Um, and then finally, it's important to get m and &E technical expertise from across all of the sectors that are involved in our cross-sectoral activity. So for example, I may know something about measuring health or nutrition-related indicators, but I know very little about measuring biodiversity. And so it's a really good thing that Sarah's at the table to bring in that kind of expertise to the discussion. Um, so to make sure that we build Merle in upfront and hard, we produced a Merle strategy with the goal of understanding conditions under which private sector-driven cross-sectoral programming results in better outcomes for both people and the planet. Um, and key outputs under this strategy include a common set of both human well-being and environmental indicators across all of the hearts, well-crafted context-specific indicators so we can measure the particularities in each individual hearth location, um, and then impact evaluation designs and selected hearths. And so by taking this approach, it allows us to monitor and evaluate each individual hearth on its own, but then also allows us to roll up those metrics to take a portfolio view of our results. So just to illustrate again, using our Mangoes for Mamas example, this means that we're developing kind of standardized questionnaire modules that allow us to measure across multiple hearths, things like, um, you know, the quantity and quality of the harvest, Things like regenerative agricultural practices, improved access to health care, um, economic well-being, health and nutrition indicators, conservation of forests, biodiversity related indicators, and so on. Um, so then the idea is to use a consistent baseline instrument for both individual hearths as a foundation um, and, and as a foundation for portfolio analysis. Um, so in sum, uh, we need to work together across sectors to solve these really big challenges, but it's difficult. So how do we manage the challenges? We need to take time to work together effectively. We can be helped if we use a common co-design approach. Um, and if we make sure that we integrate robust monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning into our design from the start. And so we can really demonstrate with Hearth, as I'm sure that others can with, with their cross-sectoral activities, when we decide to join hands to work towards those common objectives, we really can make change for the better, even in the face of these big challenges. Um, and so uh, on that note, I'd like to really, we, Sarah and I would like to really thank um, everybody who's contributed to the success of Hearth to date. And so that includes colleagues at USAID Missions, our private sector partners, implementing partners, and our technical support mechanisms, um, as well as our colleagues from across USAID Washington. Each and every person has brought in unique contributions that have really made uh, Hearth everything that it is today. And with that, um, we're happy to take any questions that the audience may have. off video here. Okay. Any questions yet at this point? Everything was crystal clear. <laughs> it's easy. Kirsten, I actually can't can't see the questions. Are you able to see them? 
Yes, I'm looking at the at the thing. There's no, there are no questions yet. Um, no questions yet. Okay. At this point, um, so Sarah, maybe I can just ask you a question. Um, what is what has been the most um, kind of eye opening or interesting thing that you've learned so far uh, during the course of getting Hearth off the ground? Oh gosh, um, putting me on the spot a little bit. <laughs> I would ask you the same thing. That's a good question. Um, I guess like how much fun it's been in addition to all of the um, complexities and challenges of getting something like this off the ground. It's just, I just feel like the opportunity to work with sector, with colleagues in other sectors has just made me a better kind of professional um, since you all approach problems a little bit differently. So I think it's just, um, it's been a lot of fun and it's been a great sort of learning experience. So that's kind of like from a personal perspective. Uh, how about you? I would 100% agree. Um, from my side, I mean, I already mentioned the part about, it was kind of eye-opening for me that um, how much communication needs to happen, both to get the work going and then also to bring others in or to build support for Hearth. Um, one thing that was, um, I learned a lot around private sector engagement and working with private sector partners. Um, I will never forget the day we were talking to one, one of our, um, it was an agroforestry activity, and we had asked uh, the private sector partners to talk about um, certain topics. And one of the topics was, what is your exit strategy? And this, this uh, representative of this company said, well, that must be a slide for USAID folk because we are here for the long run. There is no exit strategy. We are bound and determined to make this work because we don't have any other choice. Um, and to me, that was so eye-opening um, that, that our private sector partners really have skin in the game and they want to see the same development outcomes uh, and impacts that we do. And, and um, I, I had never really realized that to the same degree before. So that was um, a, a, great, a great lesson that, that I learned during the course of working with all of these great partners. Let's see. So I think with that, maybe we can uh, go ahead and close out. Kirsten, what do you think? Sounds, sounds good. That's good. Okay. Well, I guess just thank you so much, uh, everybody, for participating today. Um, it was a pleasure to give this presentation, and we will sign off. Thank okay. you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sarah.